Well, I'm glad to be in your company again. Um, it's big tales and big conversations as we build up to Qatar 2022. And as I've always said, it's great to have the record makers and the pace setters and the people who have written their names and letters of platinum in our books and in the books of the competition that we're about to celebrate. My name is Nathaniel Atta. It's great to be in your company again. And this is another edition of the Joy Sports World Cup Tales ahead of Qatar 2022. Well, seated across is uh, someone that I always struggle to introduce in public because of the credentials. The credentials in the sense that he has gone down in history as Africa's topmost scorer at the FIFA World Cup and is also one of only two Ghanaian footballers to have recorded three appearances at three different tournaments. Former captain of the Black Stars, Asamoah Jan, an all-time top scorer of Ghana, is my guest for today's edition. The baby jet, uh, and the only baby jet in football. <laughs> <laughs> it will have one go. It will have one go. It will Charlie, have one go. <laughs> everything cool? Yeah, I'm great. I'm great. Everything is fine. Charlie, Good nice life. one, nice one, nice mm. one. I, I see you play a lot of tennis lately. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And recently, you were, you know, you were honoured by the ITF president for your contribution to the sport locally as well. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I was, I was honoured because, um, honestly, I wasn't expecting it. Mm. I, I felt like I was, I was just helping the, the youth. Yeah. You know, to develop um, other sport, which is tennis. Yeah. You know, I go into tennis, um, I would say, almost two and a half years now. Yeah. And everything is going well. But mm. honestly, I wasn't expecting um, that. And uh, it's, a, it's, it's a honor to me. And I'm, I'm very, very happy, you know, uh, they were able to invite me and then um, acknowledge what I was doing in, in, in the sports within this short period of time. You know, so, yeah. Lovely. We're building up to a tournament you are very used to. And... There have been a lot of conversations centered around you, especially because you had the conversation with our partners, the BBC, and you mentioned that you would want to be at Qatar 2022. Um, as we speak, I mean, we're like very, very close and, you know, things are just about wrapped up. Mm. Um, what happened to that projection? What happened to that, that dream of doing a fourth appearance at the World Cup? And what would you like to say to... To, to the Ghanaian people who support you so much and love you so much? Um, yeah, um, you know, honestly, um, um, I spoke to BBC about um, me coming back to the field. You know, um, that was that had been my plan to, to come back to the field, you know, because um, I was struggling with injuries and stuff, you know, so I had to give myself some um, time off, you know, um, so it's like a period of two years. And then um, I felt like um, all the saw in my body, everything is healed, you know, so and it was the time frame was too much for me you know i added weights i had a lot of things to do you know so i spoke to bbc about me coming back to the field and um hopefully play uh, one or two years again you know in the game you know and, and then he asked me about then there's a possibility of me joining the world cup and i said why not um it's not it's not too late and in life anything can happen you know but honestly qatar 2020 wasn't on my mind. Qatar 2022, that. you mean? 2022. <laughs> yeah. Um, wasn't on my mind. Well, my mind is to come back to the field and join my football once again. Okay. Play score goals. Mm. You know, that is what people know me to do. So, so you mean realistically, you you do not think you can be at Qatar 2022? Realistically? You know, honestly, um, realistically, yes and no because um, it has happened before. You know, I said it that um, Rojamila has done it before. You know, he wasn't expecting. To be in um is it usa 94 or something you know um he wasn't in the team it looked like he wasn't going by the end of the day he went you know so i made some examples of it you know it doesn't mean um i have to go and play you know um honestly i haven't been with the team for quite a long time you know physically nobody know how fit i am you know i i told people i need to share weight i need to have a club playing I need to perform week in, week out, score goals. And then when I get an invitation, I have to see all these things and see whether I'm eligible to play. And that was what I said. People took it wrongly. You know, there were a lot of negative comments. There were a lot of positive comments, you know, but it, it is what it is. It all comes to a Samoa Jan, you know, so I have to just take it in good faith. Mm. There's also been talk about, you know, you playing a role, a non playing role uh, maybe being there with the team and supporting just like we've seen other examples I mean currently in the national team you have the likes of Samuel Saikufo you've had the likes of uh, 
you know, Anthony Buffo. He played a very key role when Ghana featured in the first World Cup in 2006. You were there. And so are you open to any such um, role which would not necessarily be on the pitch? Because others have spoken about it. I know uh, former FA chairman, Dr. Nyaho Nyaho Tamaklo, has been very, very strong about that point of having you play a role in, in Qatar for the Black Stars. Yeah, um, I think uh, Mr. Nyaho Tamaklo uh, has followed the game quite a long time. Uh, growing up, we, we saw him uh, being uh, with Hakka Sofo, being with the FA and everything, you know. He's got experience, he knows what he's seen. And I do really appreciate um, his comments. And um, honestly, although I've served, I've served the nation for quite a long time, I feel like um, I don't need to go knocking on their doors or to go begging for people to, to, to help, you know. They know what I can do and they know the kind of person I am, you know. So, and I'm always ready to help. I'm always a good citizen, a good Samaritan. I've, I've been always loyal to my country. You know, um, I fought for my country, even inward and outside the country, you know. So, whilst I'm here, um, I feel like if they need my services or to help the team, they will knock on my doors. I don't have to come and be knocking people's doors. So, um, as I always say, I'm, I'm, I'm around, I'm, also, I'm always here to help, you know, so anytime Ghana need my services or anytime the GFA, everybody thinks I can play a role and they are ready to give me a role, why not? We are all, we are, we are all in Ghana to help. Great stuff. Baby Jet, you've played in three World Cups. Um, you're a record setter. That's not the only record you've set with the FIFA World Cup. Mm. That must be a, a real good feeling, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a good feeling. You know, um, sitting back and watching myself 10 years ago, 12 years ago, 14 years ago, and then um, I see myself and I'm like, hey, I've been able to achieve something, you know, um, in a game. Because coming up, I didn't know I'll get to that level. All right, I knew I would get to that level because I prophesied, I told people, I told my classmates and everybody, I'm going to get to that top level, but not to that extent of setting records and then being the all-time African goal scorer in the World Cup, all-time goal scorer for Ghana. All these things, I see it as, um, as a bonus to me. You know, uh, my mindset is to get there, but those things coming afterwards is huge it's something huge and it takes decades to get people like that to do it you know people come and go but I, I feel like what I've done so far in the game will take decades for 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 a country to to get it and um, I feel happy to be part of this great game called football you know I'm, I'm very to be part of it and then leaving a legacy in the, in this game well if you just joined us we're sharing special time with Ghana's all-time top scorer and also Africa's uh, highest scorer at the FIFA World Cup and we're throwing focus or putting the lens on Qatar 2022 as the Black Stars look forward to a fourth appearance um, the first three saw this man wear a jersey for the Black Stars and he scored the goals as well Asamoah Jan is my guest as we go through uh, this first phase of this conversation, which I trust will go into a second phase because the stories are so vast. Baby Jet, um, do you feel you have done everything you need to do for the national team when it comes to big stages like the World Cup? Um, I ask this because there are those who, or there are those who, sit back and analyze and say listen baby jet you have served you have done your bit leave the legacy and let it be celebrated don't bother to go play again because you don't need to prove anything anymore to anybody do you share that opinion uh, yeah um you know um, in life, everybody has got his own opinion you know mm. for example when you have something you need to achieve personally there are a lot of people who have their opinion but you know what you want you know um right now i don't I, I, i'm not saying i have to go to the world cup i have to do that 
I'm called by the people. And that when I'm on the street, people have their comments. People say, oh, we need you one more time. You know, and then the following day, you, you, you hear people saying, he's done what he had to do. My job here is to serve mankind. Sometimes you need to think about yourself. And I know when I, I think about myself. And sometimes I feel like, okay, I have to do this thing to make people happy. That is my mindset, you know. So there are a lot of things. When, it's, it's very tricky, you know, because one day sometimes I sit down, I'll, I'll be like, okay, that's it. And then you go out and then this big man or somebody calls you and you say, hey, you have a lot to offer. They motivate you. You have to go home, sit down, come back to your senses or say, okay, I'll give it a try. The following day, you go out, they say, no, that's it. He has nothing to prove. You know, so it's, it's a mix. You know, it's like people play with your mind. Yeah. You know, and everything comes back to me to decide. If I feel like, okay, this is good for me, it's up to me to decide. And sometimes people's opinion also matters sometimes. You know, but at the end of the day, it's a summer jam we're looking at. You know, so as I said, this, is, this thing is very, very tricky. And I've, I've said it all over and all over again. Come back, coming back to the game, I'll give it a try and see how my body reacts to, 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 to the game. If I feel like, okay, I, I'm not feeling good like the way I, I was or the way I want to feel, I'll just announce my retirement and that's it. Great. We, 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 we have many, many memories, fond memories of you uh, play at the FIFA World Cup. I've had conversations with a couple of people who worked with you the team psychologist, you know, former FA vice president, you know, your, your former captain, some of your playmates and all of that. And they share some very interesting, you know, stories. In, in, in all of this, which of the moments in all the three experiences strike you the most for the most positive reasons? In other words, your best moment. My best is moment... It, is it easy to, to, to pick out out of the three World Cups? <laughs> I, had, I had a lot of great moments. You know, um, I said it in the book. Those who mm. want to have the book, um, it's online on Amazon. You can go buy it. You know, um, I said it. You know, I had a lot of great moments when it comes to the World Cup itself. You know, but my greatest moment was against the game before against um, America the game against America the first one or the second the second one 2010 2010 you know um, okay. although in 2006 that was my first um, mm. World Cup you know I was in the experience yeah you know um, I told my brother I'm going to be the first player to score for Ghana you know after we've lost the game against Italy you know, and I was able to deliver. I was able to do. What what convinced you so much that you were going to be the man? Um, you know, um, when you assess my 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 quality, you know, um, growing up, everywhere I go, I stand out. Everywhere I go, since I was a kid, I feel like everywhere I go, I I stand out, and I assess my quality, and people assess my quality, and they feel like. I'm a complete player. There's nothing in the game that I lack. You know, so you having all these tools, you have to be just fit to play. That's it. Because you have all the qualities. You know, I can run, I'm, I'm, I'm fast, I can jump, I can shoot free kicks, I can dribble, I can score one on one on one, I can play left and right, I can do anything. I have a good control, good turning, everything. You know, I feel like so what I need is to be just fit 100% fit so I had all these things and then we lost the our first game inexperience and I felt like okay I need to push harder in the second game and me having all these qualities I feel like I can score and no disrespect to others and I, I, I also knew my qualities was too much than the other strikers which also had um, their qualities of scoring, but I felt like I was superior, you know. So I remember I told my my brother, 
you know, a day before the game against Czech Republic, I told him I was score. And he said, like, you asking me that. He was like, what made you think so? And I said, I feel like I was score. I did well in the first game. I had a couple of opportunities. I feel like I can correct that mistakes and make it happen. You know, fast forward, I didn't know the goal would come that early. You know, like one minute, eight seconds. I, I didn't know, but I knew I, I was score. I knew I was score in that game. And that was what happened. The, the team psychologist, Dr. Yao Infojo, tells me about the preparation and what also convinced him that you were going to score. He said he gave you a few, like, you know, mental and physical drills to do. And by the last training session, you had hit 90%. Yeah, yeah. Um, I remember he was even having a problem. He had a neck problem, so he was even tired with his neck. He wasn't even feeling that well, I remember. I and he was somebody who was assigned to the national team to do his job. Yeah. You know, so after the first game, he was moving, like, to everybody's room, you know, stacking them up about the following, the next game. And people didn't pay attention to what he was saying. Like, they felt like, okay. But as, at that young age, I was just watching him closely. You might think he might, he might be saying something, but you don't take it at heart. But I was listening to him. And what he was saying, I knew, okay, I can take some positivity from what he was saying. So, anytime he sees players and advising them, you know, everybody know me as a joker. I joke, I try to make, eh, 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 but my mind was on what he was doing. So, he gave me, an, like, some extra energy, mm. you know, to, to take into the game, you know. So, I remember, I think, before, in the dressing room. Yeah. If I could remember the exact word he said, I think he called me, and he said, "Go show Ghanaians what you got." If I could remember, you know, um, I think I went to the bathroom. I was coming. He met me there, and then he told me, "He said, go show Ghana what you got." I was like, "Oh, okay," because I told my brother the following the the, the, the day, day the day before I was gonna score. He added his, and I was like, "Okay." Now I have the VIN. I see. <laughs> you know, so everything left to me to just deliver on the field. But honestly, I didn't know it would come that early. That goal would come that early. Wow. And it was one of my best games. Wow. Yeah. And we always love to talk about the Ghana USA game because that goal, that goal was just something else. I'm talking about 2010. Yeah. Uh, that goal was something else. Look, you, you, <laughs> the ball came from behind you. I mean, tell me, tell me about the thought process that led into scoring that goal. Okay, um, there was a clearance from um, Andre because Andre knew what I can do in one one against one situation. You know, um, he had to just balloon the ball. It was a clearance. You know, he knew I was there. You know, it was just a clearance. You know, for me to do my thing. You understand? You know, so. When the ball was cleared, um, I remember Bucanegra. He was my teammate at that time. And I knew he was very, very slow at that time. You know, so I was right with him. So when the clearance was made, I was even I was sick. I was sick in, um, before that game. You were? Yeah, I was down with malaria. You know, wow. I was sick, you know, um the reporting, all these guys, they were pushing me. Jonathan Mensah, all these guys, you know, everybody who was there knew I was sick at that time. You know, so when the ball was played, I was like, I had to give everything. And I knew he was also slow, you know, so I had to just try and use my pace. You know, if it was the other defender all the way around, I wouldn't have gone because he was faster than Bocanegra. So I saw Bocanegra was not that fast. So I had to just use my pace. You know, he tried to distract me by making a tactical foul, you know. So when he distracted me, like, I lost balance. I was about to fall. So I saw the line. I, was, I felt like I was outside the 18. So I said to myself, I have to resist because there might be a free kick and then we might blow it away. But if it was in the box, I would have gone down for a penalty. 
you know but i saw it i saw like i wasn't i was outside the 18 so i had to just resist and then um <laughs> use my quality you know and uh as a striker everybody expects you to put the ball in the net you know the composure and everything was on point you know i didn't know how i was able to compose myself and then um, shot it there Charlie. It will have go. It will have go. That was a super goal, man. That was a super goal. So you can only get those stories here of the Joy Sports World Cup tales because these are in depth. These are behind the scenes, and you get it from the men and the actors in the center of all of the action. Well, uh, we'll wrap up the first half of this conversation in a bit, and we'll bring the rest of it to you next week. But you, you have you. Uh, at uh, the point in, in the team, or for a very long time in the team, where the number, number one penalty taker. Yeah. Mm. Penalty this, penalty that. You know, recently, Stephen Appiah was telling me the story about what really happened and, you know, and how the Vuvuzelas were even distracting you guys. So because of that, you couldn't hear. And um, tell me about, I, I'd want to know, we, we've spoken a lot about that that particular day and that incident against Uruguay but then let's talk about the reactions that you got from the people remember I've told you personally that I've met people on the streets I mean men ladies especially who tell me they want your number and all of that look tell me about the passion and the appreciation that was shown to the Black Stars team especially yourself in South Africa it was it was great um one of my Happiest days. That was my best year in my career. I wish um, I, had, I had that 2010 again. You know, although I've got some good memories in most of the years, you know, from 2003 with the Black Stars years, but I think 2010 was the best year in my career. You know, um, football-wise, outside football, you know, everything was working. I even came into music. It became a hit. I, I had many awards. Business was working. Football-wise, I was scoring goals. You know, I became an icon in 2010. You know, everything was on point. I remember in South Africa, anytime we go to the shops to for shopping, you know, I don't even have space, briefing space. You know, everybody was like, Gian, Gian. So now, that name is still there. Yeah, they call you Gian. <laughs> yes, they call me Gian. Yeah. So, yeah. it was my, my, honestly, my best year in my, in my career, my whole career. Wow, my whole career. Maybe someday I might have a best year in my uh, business aspect. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I don't so think I don't think <laughs> any year can be that year. Wow. We 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 live to see. We are here. You know, I'm just praying for long life. And but 2010 was my. I wish I had the same year. Well, so if I'm a prophet, I'd say to you that may your your year or your upcoming year be like a Sawajan's 2010. Are you saying an amen to that? Amen. <laughs> well, so, what is it that, that you think about when the ball is in front of you, there's just you and the goalkeeper, there's a penalty kick, and there's <laughs> thousands of people in the stands. What is it that you think about? <laughs> For me, <laughs> um, that is why um, sometimes I do ad advise these young ones coming up, you need to be practicing every time, you know, after training. My job is to score goals, you know, to face the goalkeeper every time. So when I do that, I get used to it. You know, it's so like every time you are with a goalkeeper, every time you are with a goalkeeper, you know, a midfielder or a defender, when you have him with a goalkeeper, he, he will panic because he doesn't often do that. That is, that is the problem. Um, I understand your question, but it's not an easy thing. You know, sometimes against the goalkeeper, it comes to your mind. Hey, so when I miss, what are people going to say? You understand? Charlie, a lot of things, you know. It, it, but the reason why I can't come out to say much that I have that, I'm so confident. You know, I have that composure because in life, it's, it's, it's just two things. It's the negative and positive. You know, so I've been able to psych myself from the infancy till now. You know, so... A, a, a gun we say you don't need neighbor neighbor okay you understand <laughs> like i just go and i was like it's two things do what you have to do you know so I, against the goalkeeper i make sure i breathe in and out 
because I have the control over the ball. Maybe the opponent coming had to knock on my door before getting the ball. So I have the control. So why should I be scared? You know, so there are a lot of things that go through my mind. So honestly, against the goalkeeper, I just say to myself, so be it. So that is why I always practice my craft, my, te my techniques at training, how to strike the ball. This angle, when I'm on this angle, how to strike the ball. So many game situations. So before every training, maybe I take, hey, after every training, we, we, I take like 15 minutes or 10 minutes. You know, I, I get two players, do cross, some crosses, do some finishing. Mm. Against the goalkeeper, do some finishing. Mm. So in the game, when you have this kind of, kind of situation, it takes your mind back. This is what I did in training. So I can guarantee you there are some places in the game, there are some position. When I have the ball there, 95% I will score. That is guaranteed. If I miss, I know why I miss because I'm, I've practiced that thing. Like it has been part of me. I can give you some accents. The game against Egypt, the six-one in Kumasi. Yeah. You saw the you saw the angle. The qualifier. The World the Cup qualifier. qualifier. You yeah. saw that angle. Yeah. The goal against Germany in Brazil. You saw that angle. That angle. When I have the ball there. And all my colleagues can testify. It's mm. something I've been practicing on. So when I get a ball there, <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm figuring something out. So you scored against Serbia. You struck a penalty. It was sweet. It was, uh, you know, the, it was a little elevated. Yep. I'm sure that was what you were, you were doing against uh, Uruguay as well. And it didn't go well. Um, honestly, against Uruguay, I, I wanted to put it at the far corner. Okay. And the goalkeeper's right. Okay. You know, but I got the techniques wrong. My my left didn't wasn't stuck that well. You know, so technically I got it wrong. You know, so that, that was why the ball went that high. I you see. know, but normally my penalty doesn't go that high. That high. Mm. Even the penalty shootout, I scored, but I don't know how that ball went that high. How do I scored? I felt like it was even a mistake. But I got it right. Even that one that you scored. After yes. Okay. Yeah. I, 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 that was not how I wanted to shoot it. I see. You know, tactic, technically, I got it wrong. It looked like a great kick in front of everybody. But that is not how I wanted it. And sometimes we, the playing body on the field, we know what we want to do on the field. But it, it comes out nice. You know, people will be, oh, Tali, he did this one. But we know. And it's, it's, it's everywhere. I think even your job, sometimes you do mistakes. And then uh, people see that, you know, the best thing, you know. But I always say this, even the second one, I made a mistake in that, that second one. I see. But it went in, you know, so I, so I had to just take it out. Wow. Now, in, in all of these as well, would you have a rating of a game which you think, uh, you know, was your toughest in all these three experiences? My toughest game? Yes, Germany, Brazil, and South Africa. My toughest game was against Italy. I see. In the first game. I see. 2006. Um, I remember I was interviewed and I was asked who was the strongest defender I've ever played with. And I said Cannavaro. Fabio Cannavaro. Because I felt like I'm a complete player. And if this guy can take me out from the game, you know, outplayed me, then he's the best player. I was 20 years at that time. I made that interview, and guess what? That year he was the, he won the Ballon d'Or in 2006. So I know when a defender is tough. You know, I know. He, although he wasn't that tall, but he knows how to anticipate. He does right things at the right time. He he can jump. You know, he's somebody who is well calculated in doing his things. So I think that game was one of my best games. Uh, one of my difficult games, yeah. And talk about difficult moments. Ghana had our fair share. You've seen all the faces of it. Um, starting on a, on a very smooth note, on a modest note in Germany. Climbed it up, came to South Africa, lifted it. And there were very high expectations to the extent that the president at the time hosted you to a dinner. I was there. Hosted the whole team to a dinner before, uh, you know, the team and playing to Brazil. Yeah. And then trouble started. You'd get on the phone with the president and 
you're not able to convince your teammates to forget about the bonuses and go and play. Honestly, as a captain, I did what I had to do. Mm. You know, I did everything behind the scene that a captain had to do. Um, people, even some of the players didn't even know I was talking to the sitting president. That's um, uh, former president of Ghana, John Brown Mahani Mahama. He's, he's somebody, he's a president that at this time, I speak to him 24-7 on the phone. I see. And he was somebody that always calls me to ask about the team. I see. You know, um, very, very humble man. Very, very good man. You know, rather unfortunately, he's not, he's not a president. You know, um, MPP is in power now. But I say it's as it is. You know, I've worked with a lot of um, guys, but he was the only one who was always on phone with me. And he was the only one, when I talked to him, he tried as much as possible to, to get a job done. I see. You know, and uh, back to the question, I was, I was the one, I did what a captain had to do. You know, about the money issues, you know, um, I had to stay up from 7 p.m. to 5 a.m. in the morning. And then we had a game against Portugal at 1 p.m. You know, so how many hours are we going to sleep? So from 7 p.m., I had to be going to players' room to be begging. Sometimes I had to take Andre with me, you know, to beg all the players, you know, to, to make sure we forgot. You know, it looked like things wasn't working at that time. All what I did wasn't working. So I had to just call the, the president, and the president had to do what he had to do to make us happy. And that was what happened. You know, um, by the end of the day, things went wrong. You know, there were a lot of criticisms. You know, I even heard people saying, one person saying I should go to a leader, leadership school, which the person didn't know what happened in Brazil. You know, but um, I had to take it in good faith. It's, it's a life lesson, you know. So, and I think we've taken something from it. Now, what do you see? Before we go to tournaments, all these things get settled like three months before the tournaments. You know, so I think all what happened is, is a blessing in disguise. You know, we were able to take lessons from it. You know, that is why we are here. There are a lot of players who paved their way for us. We have also paved the way for other people about these bonuses and all these things. Now, we have cleared the way for them and they are enjoying now. Now they know uh, before every tournament, you speak about bonuses three months before or a month before for you to have a sound mind to play your football so at least we've been able to um, learn something from it mm. that loss against Portugal I mean after that result I sat back and thought it was a very unnecessary loss we could have won that game and this is a team that I didn't even trained yet look at the kind of performance we were able to put up there were those who thought that because of the crisis uh, and the fact that we hadn't trained properly, we're going to be well off by maybe like a five goal margin or a six goal. For margin. me, for me, I think we trained. Mm. We trained well. Mm. We trained. Before we were prepared for the game. But I would say there were distractions. Okay. We had to do what we had to do. Um, a day before, that was when there were a lot of distractions. But at the end of the day, we got it done. We went to training. Trained well. You know where the problem started was after the training after our dinner at 7 p.m. And a day before, the game was 1 p.m. in the afternoon. So from 7 p.m. in the evening, and then 1 p.m. in the afternoon. And then I remember all the players went to sleep around 5 a.m. I see. From 7 p.m. to the next morning, 5 a.m. Wow. Just imagine that time. That was when everybody was allowed to sleep. And then the game was at 1 p.m. And then we have to go to the stadium two hours before the game. So how many hours are we supposed to sleep? Just two hours. So we slept at five, we have to wake up at seven, prepare eight, nine, move, go to the stadium. So physically, I would say we are not that ready physically because we didn't get enough rest you know 
for, for, for that game. And then we played at 1 p.m., very hot afternoon that day. So, and just imagine how we played. We played so well. If there were a bit of no dis distractions, I think we would have um, beaten Portugal. You've worked with technical people, you've played with players in your teams, in your clubs, and in your, uh, you know, I mean, on the opposing side as well. Which player would you say made one of the biggest impressions on you on the stage of the FIFA World Cup? Biggest impression? Yeah. Like in a Ghana team or...? Well, opposing teams. Biggest impression? Ronaldo. Okay. Ronaldo, the Brazilian. Okay. He's my, he's my greatest player of, of all time. He's somebody I don't think we'll get. In no this. generation can produce another, another Ronaldo we, new, new, new generation can produce a player, but I don't think a new gen, somebody like the, the generation will get a player like him. He, he inspired me so much, you know, um, talking about the world stage. Although he wasn't a complete player because um, he doesn't use his head that well, but he's, 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 he was a beast. Amazing player. Like, I've, I've never seen a player like him. And I don't think I'll see a player like him. Wow. Yeah. Did you have a conversation with him after the game? He, he doesn't speak English. <laughs> he doesn't yeah. speak English. I don't know whether he speaks English or he speaks not. Portuguese. But I haven't uh, yeah. seen him speaking English before. Um, I saw him in 2006 when we played them in their 116. One, one and I was like, this guy. And I, I had wanted to take a picture with him, but you know, sometimes you see somebody you admire so much and then... You are starstruck. Yeah, you are starstruck. <laughs> and everybody, Just like people see you and they are starstruck. Yes, and everybody ended up taking pictures with him and I didn't take a picture with you him. You were just there. Yeah, I was just there. I was starstruck. I was just looking at him. <laughs> he's somebody I... When it comes to football, he's somebody I... A great player. Like, I don't think I will... I admire a player like Ronaldo ever. Who, who would you say were your closest allies in the Black Stars team? Look, I, I remember a conversation with uh, ex-captain Stephen Appiah, and he spoke about, and, and this is not just from him, but others who worked with the team. And they spoke about how he used to bring all of you, the senior players, along with him in decision-making, you know? Who were your allies? I mean, there were those who had common roommates, you know, from camp to camp and all, all of them. Um, yeah, Stephen was the one I learned this thing from. You okay. know, um, even that time, the reason why Stephen was successful was because of that. Because he had a, this elite players with him at that time playing their top leagues playing best football at that time we had Michael Asian, we had Sule Muntari Richard Kingston John Mensah Laie Kingston Otoado John Pencil at that peak you know at that time when you see the team you know oh these are men so even sometimes the captain doesn't even speak you know what he does is he calls all the players we do our meetings and even when we go to the meeting he doesn't speak he sit down and then we speak although i was young at that time but i was one of the important players in the team so even stephen wasn't even speaking in the, at meetings it was all these big guys with names they were the one fighting for 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 him and that was stephen's success you know so i always say to myself i wish i was in stephen's shoes because my time, I had young players around me who were scared to talk. Because when they talk, they're scared they'll take them off the team. So that was my difficulties that I was facing. I wish I was in Steven's shoes. That was why Steven is, great, uh, is, is classified as one of the best captains, best captains we've yeah. ever had. Because he had the tools with him. Like, he had everything. And sometimes he didn't even speak. And I, I learned that from, um, from Steven, bringing the uh, 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 senior players together, you know, to, to, to have a meeting and then you face um, the big men, you know. So 
Stephen was also a great inspiration for us. Wow, interesting stuff there. We talk about the coaches as well. Uh, we see that you've uh, ventured into coaching and you're looking forward to doing stuff. Is it, is, it, is, it, is it a projection, for instance, for you to one day lead Ghana <clears throat> to the FIFA World Cup as coach? Anything can happen. You know, anything I mean, can the happen. The Beckham Bears have done it, the, the Deschamps and, and stuff have done it. So. Yes, anything can happen. You know, um, for me, uh, I know I have the IQ. You know, um, I, I can read games. You know, sometimes I sit home and I, I do some assessment and it works. You know, and um, maybe I watch football with people. I tell them this, 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 and they see it happening. You know, so there are a lot of encouragement from back door. You know, and personally, I know, I know, it, I know the game. You know, so I uh, just feel like getting the licenses is a good thing to secure my coaching skills. You know, to secure maybe you might never know a team might come and I decide to go fully into football although i'm a businessman I, I might get up one day and say okay i'm going full into football and maybe i might start by coaching or something and that was why i decided to get the license to be secured don't don't you get worried sometimes about the the statistic you know the very limited statistics of great players who do not necessarily become uh, great coaches for instance the almighty Diego Armando Maradona, I mean, if you compare what he did with Argentina as a captain, you know, to what he did as a coach, I mean, they are two poles apart. Um, Didier Deschamps was, was successful in that, that regard. But don't you get worried? Yeah, um, you get worried, but as a coach, you know, uh, you don't expect a player to be like when you were playing. When you, when you do that, you make mistakes you know because in ghana everybody knows as Samajan, as blah 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 and maybe i'm coaching and i feel like okay this guy hasn't got the quality that i had when i was playing so i have to find one quality and make sure i emphasize it i emphasize on it for the player to be better in that quality because i can the player can never be like a Samajan. and what i have to do is to just see his um, strongest point and then I can create something around it for the, for the player. But if you a coach, if you're a coach and then you feel or you want a player to be like when you were playing, then you make, you make mistakes. And that is what I, I, I know. And I think these players who, all these big players who don't become successful have that, that is what I think. They have that in mind. Like they want the players to play like when they were playing and to be to be a coach you shouldn't I, I think it's a big mistake when you start thinking like that I see we have a very tough task ahead of us in you know in Qatar and some call it unfinished business with Portugal and Uruguay some say we're gonna do well others say would come all after the first round and all of that from where you sit how do you assess things um that is that is where the players have to uh, challenge themselves you know sometimes that is what um, i always say sometimes opinions also matter sometimes you know hey mini i know man charlie people will say this people will say this you have to take certain things but at the end of the day you will make the final decision but at least you have to see what is going on around town like hey people are saying revenge people are seeing this it can even motivate you to prove a point so for me i think everything will depend on the black stars not only the players the playing body you know because you don't only depend on those going on the field you we have to do our homework well everything behind the scene make sure we are ready and then we can deliver on, on the field so it's, it's, the, it's as you said it's a huge task ahead of us but everything will depend on the on the, on the playing body you know how they will slide themselves before the game where did you spend your time um in in 2018 when the world cup was was going on you know especially without ghana <laughs> it was 
a heartbreak. It was a heartbreak for me, you know, um, because it was my dream to play the World Cup cons uh, consecutively it, yeah. before I retire. You know, so it was like everything was going well. You know, my first World Cup, 2006, 2010, Brazil. So it was like three on the row. So I wanted the fourth time on the row, and then it didn't happen. So I was like, I was heartbroken, you know, but. I was I, I really enjoyed it. I was in Ghana at that time, you know. So I watched it at home. Mm. <laughs> and I mean, how it's it's I I watch the game as a journalist and, and a football fan. Mm. You watch it as as a player who's played there on the on the field before. It's it must be different. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a different thing altogether. You know, when especially prior to the game, you know what happens before the game. You know, the media attention, you know, it's great moments. You know, sometimes sit down, journalists come all over you talking about the game. You see fans, you see a lot of different, different countries. You know, football brings people together, you know. So when we are there and then maybe I'm, I'm sitting on the screen watching, it takes my mind back. Okay, well, I've been here before. And even sometimes you tell friends, Oh, quite too no if you. We've been there before. You know, you know this. All these things is not yeah. jokes and yeah. you yeah. know. But at the end of the day, it's it's an amazing experience. You know, yeah. um, I will urge every footballer to work so hard. You know, to be at that level because it's every footballer's dream. You know, you can do anything, but without playing the World Cup, not the Junior World Cups, the Senior World Cups. You know, um, it's an amazing experience. You know, very, very amazing. <laughs> now you've you've uh, you've done punditry as well. So sometimes you know when you because they they always say one of the criticisms that people give pundits is that you sit there behind the screen or you sit you know on that set and and do technical analysis. But then you know on ground is is completely different. You know, tell me about that experience of doing punditry and now having to experience the game. You know at. at at long range and being a main actor yourself, <laughs> putting all these three together. Personally, I feel like, you know, uh, personally, people see me as the jovial type mm. when I'm going to play, but they forgot about the passionate type when I'm on the field. That is the difference. You know, I'm very, very passionate when I'm on the field. I'm the jovial type outside the field. I try to make people happy. You know, so being a pundit, um, as I said, I also, have to analyze what I see, the IQ that I have in the game. You know, there are some things I see that maybe the second person doesn't see. So I try to give my views on, on what I see. And one thing I think the most difficult part is the um, preparation to the game, the prior to the game. That one hour to discuss about the game. That is the most difficult part in Panditry work. But watching the game in the first half to analyze what you see, that is my job because I've been in a game. I've watched the game, the first half. So coming to analyze it is so easy for me. And I think the Panorito where I did the most difficult part is that first one hour, that discussion that you make prior to the game. You know, you need to get information about the players, you know, talk about the build up to the game and everything. That is the most difficult part. Well, if you had something to change about all these uh, summed up experiences of the World Cup um, what key things would you have done differently? Differently? The penalty miss of course <laughs> the penalty miss of course I, yeah. I didn't expect anything aside that <laughs> <laughs> that, is, that is the only thing um, every Ghanaian can say about the Well, okay how would you have struck it now tell me about that um you know, since that day, I had to change how, to, how I shoot my penalty. Okay. You know, now I watch the goalkeeper till the end. Okay. You know, because the goalkeeper has to take a step before moving. And so I watched that last step for me and then I, I placed it. You know, but before I focus on one place in my mind. And apply watch, power. Yes. And then apply power. Mm. You know, whether the goalkeeper goes there or not, I just picture that place. I'm striking it here, strong. And that was what... Yeah, took the ball off. Yeah. And then after, I, I changed how I, I shoot my penalty. 
and it's worked. Okay, so if you had to relive 2010 now uh, against Uruguay, you would have gone for placement rather than power. Yeah, I would have gone for placement. I see. I would have gone where would you have placed it? Left, um, right? It would depend where the goalkeeper moves. Okay. You know, I, I, I don't decide where I have to put it. I, I, I rely on the goalkeeper first, mm. now. So if he doesn't move, I place it wherever I want. You know, because every step you make, the goalkeeper has to take a step before going. So you see it, you see it coming. It's something that I had to practice. You could see Joninho in, uh, in Chelsea. You know, he jumps. So when he jumps, he sees the goalkeeper's movement and he plays it. But this time, I, my, I don't jump. Like how Balotelli shoots is. Mm. He just puts the ball, watch him, there. So, if I had to change something, that is what. But they say sometimes placement is a very difficult technique to do on the penalty spot. Yes, it takes a player to have um, both. Yeah. <laughs> that confidence too. And I feel like I'm a confident player, you know, because of what I can do when I'm on the field. You know, it's not that, it's not everybody that had that confidence to, to do it. You know, it's, it's, I think, I would say I'm one of the guys that is God gifted. You know, um, sometimes people see me on the street and they ask me, so all these criticisms and everything, how do you, how do you cope? And I said, this is That me. was going to be my last question to you. <laughs> <laughs> about the criticisms yes. criticisms um i came to understand in life that everything you do people will talk people have something to say about it so and i i learned these things from 2008 african cup of nations you know there was a game against namibia ghana, ghana expected the black stars to score like 10 goals you know, we scored just one. You know, there was one opportunity at a cute angle against Namibia. I missed, you know, and that criticism, like, I've never been in pain like that before. You know, I said it in my book. You know, I've never been in that pain. The one Ghana hosted in, uh, in Can 208. You know, so after I was like, oh, okay. Now I'm a man. If you do the right thing, people will praise you. If you do the wrong, they will criticize you. You know, so it's, it's two things. So when people, I see people on the street and they start, they start maybe chanting my name, mobbing me here around, it doesn't get to me. I just enjoy that moment. Because I know tomorrow if I do the mistake, same people will criticize me. You know, so when people cheer me up, of course, it's, it's good. You know, but I don't let that get to me that much. I enjoy the moment. In, and that is what I would advise everybody to do. When you go to places and people cheer you up, mob you here and there, enjoy that moment. But just have it in mind when things go wrong. Will the same people cheer you up? Nope, they're not going to do that. You see the same people and sometimes you can see somebody who had praised you before. The same person criticizing you. That is when, if you are not careful, you'll be in pain. Like, you, you, you understand yeah. what I'm trying to say. So that is my advice. When people cheer you up, just enjoy the moment. If you have to give them money, you give them. If you don't have, go. Because the same people will criticize you. Ghana, going past the group stage at the World Cup. Yes, no. It's possible. Mm. It's possible because I've, 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 I've been in that situation before. Ghana have been ruled as underdogs. And you were able to qualify. 2006, 2010. We didn't qualify in 2014, but we've done it before. So there's a possibility we can we can qualify from the group stage. But they have to prove me right. Asamwa, <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> well, and uh, that accolade is one that he picked up from Stephen Appiah. If you missed uh, the book launch, uh, you'd have to go and watch it on YouTube. <laughs> and of course, the book is on Amazon as well. Uh, this has been the big conversation, the much awaited one as well with the legendary Asamoah Gyan, the man who's the first to have scored a goal for Ghana at the FIFA World Cup, sinking his uh, boot in the sands of time when it comes to Ghana's history and Ghana's stories with the World Cup. Well, tales continue and uh, the build-up is on, uh, the Ghana vibe is on, and we're looking forward to a hopeful, great performance in Qatar.
thanks to the whole production team, thanks to the legend himself. And um, let's do this again uh, in a couple of days' time when I have another big conversation with loads and loads of backstories as we always do it. Thank you so much. My name is Nathaniel Atto, and I have love for sport.